Welcome to Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Uh, things have drastically changed in the last year and a half in terms of engagement. You know, there's no more, uh, you know, organizations that were really used to an in-office culture uh, suddenly had to adapt. Some of them are coming mm -hmm. back to that, but it's not so easy. So I think the context for me um, would, or maybe the, the springboard would be around setting up the now and like the urgency right now. And because what we're seeing, uh, that was part one. And then part two was uh, in terms of the retention, recruitment and all that mm -hmm. is that people who've left companies, um, you know, in that second quarter of 2020, mm -hmm. uh, some of them came back, some of them took other jobs because mm -hmm. now people are rehiring. As a result, there is a dearth of uh, knowledge um, that was kind of left, that wasn't left behind um, because it wasn't captured and it wasn't shared. And mm -hmm. as a result, many of these companies that are rehiring have to start from scratch. So what if there was a way to capture and share knowledge before this kind of crisis happens? Um, and rather than treat it as an emergency thing, you know, and have to mm -hmm. catch up, you know, what if we could put in place a system that's structured and that actually acknowledges that this is going to happen, that people are going to leave and they're going to leave with, with what they know, who they are, um, you know, there are various ways. And, mm -hmm. and so what I've been thinking about is that knowledge, it's almost a misnomer because it's not just the, the it's not just what people know, it's what they do, it's how they do it, it's who they are, their ways of being, it's probably part of their culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking culture from when they were born, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's probably the things that they learned when they were a child that they're still using today. You know, storytelling is a great way to, to capture that because that's what we, it's just as natural we, we naturally learn from stories um, as kids. And so the things that we still, our behaviors today are very much informed by that. It's kind of, it would be unbelievable to me to think that, you know, you can, you, you're, you're made by the, um, what you know, do and how you are is made by how you went, where you went to college or how many years of experience you have in a company. That's part of it but it's definitely not the, the most important well, I part. I always think about context because you can, um, when I interview people, when I coach people, I want to always hear their why. And I think the same um, thing happens when you're sitting at a table in a meeting and people are sharing their project plans and their information and then giving you that big opinion, that won't work or this has worked in the past. The thing that gets missing from most of the conversations, we hear an opinion, we just ready start to form a debate or, you know, an advocacy about why we think it will work, but no one really gets into the nitty gritty of the why. And I think that's one of the things with some of these stories help um, bring the context to the table. I think you could save a lot of time and money mm -hmm. and, um, and build a better rapport engagement with team members when they start to understand the concept. I used to have a credenza, one of my old offices, where I called the, you know, the the place where good ideas went, went to to die. And you, you you looked at it and you went, what was why didn't these projects work? They looked pretty reasonable when you know in the write up. Like, but mm. there was stories behind those those PowerPoint presentations or those big decks that were in there about all the predecessors and all the projects that didn't take root. And I think that always stays in my mind as a visual about let's have less of that and more conversation about what's happened. And then you made a good point. Like a lot of people, they turn, they're, they're leaving their organizations. Change is always constant. And to be able to hand off or give people that wealth of knowledge 
about what it was to work in a certain situation and why it worked or didn't is a valuable gift you give to the whole organization, whether it's the on, people being onboarded the people in their jobs right now and the ones who are trying to figure out if they even want your job <laughs> to go mm. through. So those are things to look at. And um, it should be a natural practice. It shouldn't be in, uh, you know, like you said, a, a crisis situation right. to, to yeah. run down the hallway and try to collect all that information in, in a one hour um, interview. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I think what I'm seeing too is that there's a, uh, you know that there's a a there's a there's a sense that right now is a, a really big opportunity for people to put in place systems and practices mm -hmm. that that not only acknowledge that this is happening and that you need to be mm -hmm. able to capture and share people's knowledge uh, in a systematic way, mm -hmm. uh, but also that it's it's like the, the reason that it's right now is to me is that, you know, as I think you were mentioning too, is that there's, this is a recruitment tool essentially, because mm -hmm. like, I'll just give an example. I mean, one of the things that I've seen is uh, just recently being in a conversation with, uh, you know, someone who, who's the head of people at a real estate company and um, in, in New York city. And so when we were, and we started talking back in March, 2020. So obviously at that point, everything was frozen and and she was starting to think about when things would reopen. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, we had no idea that it would be this long, mm -hmm. but I just spoke to her a couple of weeks ago. Now, you know, people do have the option to go back to the office. She's now been fully vaccinated, so she's gonna go back soon. Um, and others have decided to stay remote. Mm -hmm. And so, so she's now part of her mandate is to try to figure out a kind of a hybrid uh, mm -hmm. format. But what's top of mind is all these people who've left and, and they're having to rehire. And she's quite overwhelmed by the hiring process. But mm -hmm. one of the things that she felt was really important to this moment was to capture the stories of the people who were in the company, who are in the company right now, mm -hmm. um, and use those as a way of attracting the candidates um, that they're looking for. Because, you know, there's so much competition and and this was true pre-pandemic in terms of talent. I remember these words, there's a talent, talent mm -hmm. crisis and, you know, yeah, yeah. and of course that didn't, that, you know, that didn't pan out for 2020, but now we're starting to gradually hear the same things. It's, it's a different context, mm -hmm. um, but essentially it's the same, you know, it, for all intents and purposes, for those people who are recruiting and hiring, it's, it's essentially the same problem, you know, and so here is something that she's viewing as, as a difference maker, essentially, mm -hmm. and, and something that could really, by, by showing and telling the stories of current employees about what it's like to work in her company um, and what it is that they do, then she's attracting people that understand that system mm -hmm. of belief, those values, and, are, and she's naturally attracting those and weeding out those who don't actually have the same belief systems. Because mm -hmm. the stories, instead of a few words or being in something that, you know, where ideas go to die, <laughs> I mean, which I love, you know, it, it, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's sort of like, that's what happens most of the time with these words that we use to express who we are as a company and an organization, as a team. It just sits in a brochure, it sits on a wall in the office and nobody really sees it, much less nobody lives by it. So here she's seeing an opportunity to say, well, no, I do have people who actually live by these things. So instead of, you know, just telling you our five attributes and our five mm -hmm. values, let me show you the stories of real people, those people who could be your colleagues, mm -hmm. telling you real life stories about how they lived by those values. Uh, it makes, makes a huge difference. And now she's talking mm -hmm. about doing this, you know, 30 second biographies on their website. So I think there's, there's definitely something around around that aspect of like the outcome. Yeah. Uh, but it's getting to the outcome that's sometimes seeing really seen as a real challenge when you're trying to do all these other things. And 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 I think one of the things that we've been talking about is kind of busting a little bit that myth that mm -hmm. it is such a daunting thing and it's and it's actually not that difficult to do. 
Yeah, I think one of the most powerful lessons I learned in interview training was to ask people, I called it their 2020 question. And I used to get some odd looks because it was, tell me a situation where you failed. Mm. But it was something that applied to your experience and how you work today. So it always mm. impacted your perspective. Now, what was a little more unusual is I would share one of my failures about managing recruiting at my earlier stages and what it taught me and how it made me a better interviewer or coach with staff. Mm. But, but in that moment, when people were could see their wheels turning going, this isn't just, oh, I want to not as work as hard. You know, all those negative questions you're supposed to pre-train yourself to answer. Right. This really showed context about where a person was comfortable with themselves, how they achieved um, a success after a mishap or a challenge, but also what they've learned from it and they were okay with it. And I think it really created a bond mm -hmm. at that stage because I knew a little bit more about them than your just your typical interview question. So in turn, I could advocate for them. And I think that always stayed with me. And that's what I like about storytelling. There's a certain amount of vulnerability in saying, okay, I want to hear, I'm going to tell you when we were sweating and figuring out if we weren't going to make this deadline, but this is how we got over conflict. This is how we started to pull in other resources or listen to other voices at the table. So I think mm -hmm. in that drama, there is lessons we're saying, wow, they really are showing their cards and they, they mean what they're saying. It's not just pretty words that have been curated on a shiny PDF or on a website. People want to know what they're about, particularly since we're in these rectangles for a good part of our time. We're going to be in a hybrid model. So I can't walk down the hallway and eavesdrop on you to see <laughs> what you really sound like and acting. And I don't get to see how you're interfacing with your staff. I have to take mm. you at face value or on mm. these mega Zoom calls. So those yeah. stories, I think, are going to be more important now to get to get some trust building going on some human connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. You just reminded me of something, too, which is that, um, uh, you know, how, how we how we figure out, uh, you know, these interactions, mm -hmm. or it's not about necessarily replacing interactions that were happening mm -hmm. in an office, uh, but it's definitely providing some kind of space mm -hmm. um, that is in this context, how we're speaking right now, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, still provides an element of um, uh, discovery, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, where, or, or, you know, coincidence or, or mm -hmm. chance, essentially, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, you know, which is exactly what you described, you know, I'm walking down the, the corridor, I see someone, it reminds me of something I've been wondering about, that's the perfect person to ask because of their title or because I had mm -hmm. lunch with them a week ago. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily think about that behind my, my computer in my own home office. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and I think that's really crucial, you know, is to is to think about the ways that we can create those spaces. You know, mm -hmm. what we call what we call a dedicated space and time for for listening and storytelling is essentially what organizations need to do for these chance encounters and kind mm -hmm. of you know structurally create an informal meeting, uh, as paradoxical as that might sound. And so, it, which essentially is choosing a block of time and asking people to come to that. But instead of having this, is where I think. It's not so, the, the, the daunting aspect of, of this that I often hear is like, well, I've got, already got an onboarding system. I've got my compliance mm -hmm. in place. You know, it's a great platform. People just go through it. And actually now is the right time for me to continue to do that and maybe mm -hmm. to do it even more because I don't have an opportunity to meet people in the office and I have to rehire all these people. I just have too much on my plate, right? So I can't add this whole element that you're talking about. But actually, what we're saying is that it's not necessarily, to me, it's not necessarily part of the onboarding price, process. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. But rather, it's finding and creating a space and time for people to meet in a way that's not the formal meeting to talk about the mm -hmm. agenda of selling or marketing our products or whatever meetings you have on a day-to-day -day basis with your team and your, and your leaders. But rather, it's about facilitating a conversation 
mm -hmm. around the direction that the organization is going in at this time so that people can tell stories around that. To, to give you mm -hmm. an example that's more concrete, mm -hmm. you know, one client that we worked with recently, one of their values is, is dare to be different. And it was the theme of one of their uh, kickoff meetings at the beginning of the year, which was all online, very much an in-office culture, almost exclusively. And suddenly they're all remote. Mm -hmm. and, and so they came up with this theme. And instead of saying, you know, we're going to talk about marketing and sales and all these things, which, you know, they did, they had some times for that. But then they also had a time to facilitate the, the, the telling and listening of stories around this dare to be different theme. And so you mm -hmm. had a hundred plus, you know, people who were suddenly put into pairs. So just one-on-one -on -one, and, and listening to these stories and sharing these stories with one another in a much more intimate way. So if you mm -hmm. can imagine this screen filled with a hundred people, and then suddenly it's just you and me. Uh, and now I'm telling you a story, I'm listening to it and you're telling me a story and I'm listening to it. And so that's that kind of, and everyone feels connected and feels a sense of belonging around this. And then you start to, because it's all recorded, you start to capture and share these stories. So I think that's that's a really, mm -hmm. you know, almost in like an easy step. It's It's about finding, what are those themes that are common to everyone in this organization? And by finding those stories, then the work comes after. But the gathering of the stories doesn't have to be this impossible thing. And, mm -hmm. and I think as much as you can put onto employees to actually have those conversations and listen to stories and tell stories, as long as you're recording, and as long as you have someone on your team that's able to, to derive the knowledge data, so to speak, mm -hmm. that's coming out of these stories. Uh, and then you're able to strategically use them. And that's when we could see from this event that we facilitated, we could see that out of the 50 submitted stories, 10 were great for onboarding because that's mm -hmm. what a new hire needed to hear. 20 were great for new salespeople because that's mm -hmm. what a salesperson needs to hear when they're in that situation and so on and so forth. So it's almost like you're ending up with a story library. But the first step is really about, you know, wh what are those themes and values that are common to everybody? And, and then ask people to tell stories around that in a very, you know, dedicated way, record that and start to parse out what, what the stories are about. I think, you know, for me, it's, it's getting to those first steps. Uh, that's often the tricky part, but once you do, mm -hmm. it kind of takes a life of its own. I like what you said. And also when you have, I mean, I think stories should be a holistic process. It shouldn't just live in one experience. Like you said, it's, it's not a few stories you share in onboarding, like a commodity, like you give a piece of paper out or, you know, a, a, a goodie bag. And then that's all it goes. I think it has to live in every stage of the organization, every way, because one of the most valuable things you can do if you're truly looking to retain people or give them excitement about what next steps could be is where do they fit in the story and it's mm. not just their performance management document they're, they're, they're typing it into their system their hr system it's how they connect the dots to the work so one of the things about story it it's almost like you're bringing your team to the table to every meeting you're part of and explaining them all these different components of the organization and how they are connected to it and how their work matters Everyone comes at their work differently, but they're all contributors. And I think it's a way of really kind of waking up their interest level and their talents because they see parts of them or parts of the skills that they do want to use at some point showing up in different parts of the organization in other biographies that you're talking about in other profiles saying, wow, my career could take me into that seat like that person is doing. That's how they got there. So I think there's there's a lot of plays to place with it. And again, it saves time. The more you can build relationships and understanding and context, the more apt you get your projects done in a little more effective way and also not reinvent the wheel. I think sometimes organizations, whether intentionally or not, can go into silo mode. And I've been in situations where I had gone to interview different you know, hiring managers in large organizations and find out what they thought was a very unique project project to themselves was happening down the hallway and saying, mm. you both could really 
benefit from talking to each other and figuring out what the context is of why you're doing it and maybe have some shared knowledge. So whatever the purpose was is people don't know what the other, other group is doing. And I think it is a great way to um, make it real and make the work come to life. Um, there's so many great opportunities we have with these Zoom opportunities right now to bring people that would have normally, normally not met each other or seen them mm. to really interface. So we're all talking about what we lost, what we lost by not being together. I'm also an advocate of let's think about what we can gain by not abandoning some of this Zoom experience, figure out what the best hybrid to bring that to life. And I think the story work will help. And then house them, don't just put them somewhere never to look at, make them findable with the organization and make it easy. And I think you, you've got something going. You know, when you said that, um, you know, this person should speak to that person and that you would often find that, you know, you would often see, you would make connections, right? Mm -hmm. And then you would get people to to meet. I think that role that you're talking about there is, is crucial mm -hmm. um, more than ever. And because it's not just about, because you're right. I mean, we do have an opportunity to bring people together that we wouldn't normally have been able to have access to so much so easily, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is one of the great things that we've gained is that suddenly, you know, there there are Zoom meetings between the CEO and the employees like there have never been before. Actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I've certainly been hearing and reading about, and um, and so I think, but that there is a role of facilitator that's needed, mm -hmm. um, and and I think those people. Um, you know, who they are is important to identify um, mm -hmm. because they're probably going to be the custodians mm -hmm. of, of these stories, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be the ones who say that person should tell the story about X, Y, Z. That's probably the person who should meet with this other person and, and who should have a conversation about it because we're going to get so much great info from it. Um, so I think I just wanted to capture that idea Mm -hmm. Because it feels to me like that's something that is um, critical to the process, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think also there's an opportunity of why the storytelling and sharing capability is at a good point in mm. work. Because of COVID-19, because of everything that people have experienced, whether in these Zoom meetings or behind the screens, there's, I've listened to some clients be much more transparent when they're presenting in groups to their teams and also to greater organizations like at conferences where I would never have heard that a few years ago. I, I just was stunned over the course of the year about how much people were willing to maybe a little show more of themselves of mm. what really made them tick in some of their challenges. So I think because we've used that muscle, yeah, like don't lose that ability to look at the person holistically and take on the whole human and also present yourself as a leader who's, you know, working through challenges, working through things that are, um, that you need perspective on and, and value input. And I think you'll get an opportunity to receive more information when you are shown in that light um, and build some trust that way. So it's a bit of a different way of looking things. I think it's something to explore. And I know I'm not the only one that's talking about, there's other people talking about different mm -hmm. terms for that kind of leadership and where we're going for right now. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think these, um... You know, again, it's it's um, whenever you have these interactions mm -hmm. where leaders are telling stories, and you know, um, they're they're making themselves a little bit more vulnerable uh, mm -hmm. through that. They're also making themselves much more memorable. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what they're doing by giving information in the form of a story to their staff and employees and their leadership team. Uh, they're making that information much more easy to retain. And mm -hmm. so as a result, people not only retain the information, but they also kind of feel mm -hmm. the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, they feel more buy-in and they feel more like they are part of mm -hmm. 
whole. And I think that's the the important piece too is that is that people are are kind of in this um, you know they know what kinds of stories to tell um, about certain topics you know mm. so if you're so if you're telling a story about change um, and and how you've as the leader of this organization are working on navigating those changes you want to make sure that your story has your employees and staff as the characters of that mm -hmm. story, as opposed to you being the lone you know mm -hmm. person who's going to heroically change everything because that doesn't quite nobody quite believes that um, mm -hmm. but rather it's it's those stories that are inclusive that have more people than just a few leaders um, that's where I can start as an employee to see myself in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's that can sometimes be a little bit tricky to navigate is, you know, what is the story about and how do I construct that story? Mm -hmm. Well, word came to mind when you were saying that because I used the word siloed before, but insulated can also be an experience that a lot of leaderships or teams have that they're not really interfacing as much as they would like to sometimes or can with their different day. And mm. this kind of story showing can break through that a little bit and have people travel basically through those stories or really get a sense of what the organization, better than a survey, better than a lot of other things you can collect if you start to really dig down it and figure out where somebody's powerful stories are around a certain theme and, uh, and really learn from them. So I mm. think that's that's an opportunity to really travel outside of your own box, basically, whether it's right. your office or your Zoom box yeah. and um, start paying attention. And I also liked what you said before about the listening that happens in the meeting, that person who is very good at pulling key words and themes about what's happening in a room or a conversation or stories and saying, well, this keeps coming up. We need to, you know, dig deeper or explore or maybe, you know, elevate that phrase. This is something mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah. Narrative Story Talks. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com.